Okay, good morning. Go ahead and get started. My name is Sharif Girgis. I'm uh, an assistant or associate professor in the law school, and I'm very excited to be doing this event for a couple reasons. One, the title is Supreme Decision, Dobbs and the Dignity of Persons, and a year and a half on, I'm very excited to do anything with Dobbs in the title. It was one of the best moments in our national public life in several decades, and I'm especially honored to be moderating, facilitating in whatever way I can uh, the comments from these three gentlemen. I've known or known of each of them for a very long time and admired them in every case. And so I'm gonna <clears throat> just briefly read their bios for you and then hand it over to them. We'll do Q&A afterward and please remember to be uh, lining up at the microphone for the Q&A so that your voices are recorded. First up will be Far Curlin. Dr. Far Curlin is <clears throat> Josiah Trent Professor of Medical Humanities in the Trent Center for Bioethics Humanities in the history of medicine and the co-director of the Theology, Medicine, and Culture Initiative at Duke. He's worked to bring attention to the intersection of medicine, ethics, and theology. In 2012, he helped to found both the University of Chicago's program on medicine and religion and the annual conference on medicine and religion. Since 2015, through uh, the Divinity School at Duke, he and his colleagues have brought graduate theological training to those with vocations to healthcare. Starting in 2023, Dr. Curlin also is working with colleagues across North America to develop the Hippocratic Society, an association of students and practitioners dedicated to fulfilling the profession to heal. He's co-author with Chris Tollefson of The Way of Medicine, Ethics and the Healing Profession with Notre Dame Press two years ago, as well as more than 150 articles and book chapters addressing the moral and spiritual dimensions of medical practice. <clears throat> Dr. Chris Kayser rhymes with razor, is chair of, it says that right in the bio, is chair of the philosophy department at Loyola Marymount University. He graduated from the honors program of Boston College and earned a PhD four years later from this university. A Fulbright scholar, Dr. Kayser did postdoctoral work as an Alexander von Humboldt German Chancellor Fellow at the University of Cologne. He was appointed a corresponding member of the Pontifical Academy for Life of Vatican City, a fellow of Bishop Barron's Word on Fire Institute, and a William E. Simon Visiting Fellow in the James Madison Program at Princeton, where I got to know him. An award-winning author, his 16 books include Jordan Peterson, God and Christianity, The Search for a Meaningful Life, Disputes in Bioethics, Thomas Aquinas on the Cardinal Virtues, Abortion Rights for and Against, 365 Days to Deeper Faith, The Gospel of Happiness, The Seven Big Myths About Marriage, A Defense of Dignity, The Seven Big Myths About the Catholic Church, The Ethics of Abortion, Oh, rare Ralph McInerney, Stories and Reflections on the Legendary Notre Dame Professor, Life Issues, Medical Choices, Thomas Aquinas on Faith, Hope, and Love, The Edge of Life, and the Ethics of Abortion, and, and How to Be Very Productive as an Academic. <laughs> Dr. Kayser's views have been in the New York Times, the Washington Post, the Wall Street Journal, the LA Times, Huffington Post, Newsweek, NPR, BBC, EWTN, ABC, NBC, Fox, CBS, MSNBC, TEDx, and The Today Show. And then John Sullivan. <clears throat> Dr. Sullivan is a pediatric critical care physician at Wake Med Children's Hospital in Raleigh, North Carolina, where he also serves on the Ethics Committee. He's on the clinical faculty of the University of North Carolina and Duke University Schools of Medicine. He's a member of the Catholic Medical Association and its National Ethics Committee, and was the founding president of its Finger Lakes Upstate New York Guild. John is a columnist for the Notes and Abstracts section of the National Catholic Bioethics Quarterly, he received his undergrad and medical degrees from Georgetown, completed pediatric residency at New York Presbyterian Weill Cornell Medical Center, and his pediatric critical care medicine fellowship at the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia at Penn. He did additional post-fellowship training in pediatric critical care at the Children's Hospital in Sydney, Australia. He's married to Elizabeth Sullivan, the executive director of the Institute for Catholic Liberal Education. They live in Wake Forest. They have three sons and a, da and a daughter-in-law who are graduates or current students at Notre Dame, as well as one and soon to be two grandsons, and they are longstanding family friends of my in-laws. And in high school, my daughter may or may not have had a crush on his son. So <laughs> with that, Dr. <laughs> Thank you, Sharif. It, uh, if you read the abstracts, and I don't presume anyone did, um, you may have noticed that John Sullivan and I both, without coordination, are dialed in on the way the fetus has come to be ignored altogether post-Dobbs. 
in statements decrying restrictions on abortion. And John's going to trace out this pattern in judicial rulings and statements by some national medical organizations. I want to focus on the pattern in those who put themselves forward as bioethicists. Um, bi bioethicists is one of the hats that, that I wear. In bioethics, the language of personhood is used as a proxy for moral status, for indicating that a being deserves certain kinds of moral regard the regard we owe to other persons. To state the obvious, the ethics of abortion hinges on the question of the moral status of the fetus. All arguments against abortion, practically speaking, and all, all political movements to restrict abortion are grounded in the claim that the human fetus is the sort of thing that deserves the moral regard of not being intentionally killed or injured. Generally, because the human fetus is one of us, a human organism like us in essential respects, albeit very different in size, stage of development, capacities, and so on. These claims are advanced through arguments in the medical and bioethics literatures, in pro-life advocacy, in legislative bills to restrict abortion, and in arguments before the courts. I find it curious, therefore, that when prominent bioethicists post Dobbs argue that restrictions on abortion violate medical ethics, they never mention the fetus at all. Now, there may be some point of evidence that someone can find here of, of, of that not being true, but this is my observation. They, they never mention the fetus. In recent years, I've been called as an expert witness regarding medical ethics in several cases involving regulation of abortion. And in each case, plaintiffs uh, have called one or more prominent medical ethicists, some of these have been colleagues that I know well, who have agreed with the plaintiff's claim that specific regulations regarding abortion are unethical, they violate medical ethics. None of these ethicists, in their reports or testimony, has rebutted the claim that the fetus deserves moral regard, not once. Rather, in each case, the bioethicist ignores the fetus entirely. And it's an eerie phenomenon to watch. A medical ethicist colleague in an adversarial proceeding regarding abortion proceeds as if they are unaware of, like they can't hear the claim being made, that if the fetus deserves moral regard, abortion appears to be ethically problematic. It seems a striking example of studiously ignoring the elephant in the room. What can explain this pattern? I propose that the pattern of refusing to even speak of the fetus suggests that the personhood of the human fetus is conspicuous, uh, that it is hard to deny, uh, even to those who choose to ignore it. Characteristically, in a debate about an ethical issue, or frankly about any issue, one rebuts the arguments advanced by the other side. One would expect then that if Showing the fetus moral regard depends on premises that are shaky or that few find persuasive or on logic that's hard to follow. Bioethicists would point this out. They point out that abortion may affect fetuses but not persons, and they would explain the difference. Or they would make a case that although we may owe the fetus moral regard in, in some form in general, that that obligation is trumped or outweighed by other obligations, such as the obligation to respect women's bodily autonomy. Instead, bioethicists defending abortion now ignore the fetus entirely, thereby, I think, tacitly acknowledging that if the fetus is brought into view, its personhood will be hard to deny. When bioethicists are pressed to explain why the fetus does not deserve moral regard, they wave the question away as irrelevant because there is no universal consensus. This claim is repeatedly made. There's no universal consensus regarding when life begins or the moral status of the fetus. This well-worn pattern was displayed recently in a back and forth of postings on the Medical College of Wisconsin's bioethics listserv. For those in the field, this is one of the places where people, I wouldn't say necessarily argue, but at least go back and forth. And it began when a, when a colleague posted praising Matt Winnia, uh, Dr. Matt Winnia of the University of Colorado and formerly of the AMA's ethics group, and a longtime colleague of mine at the University of Chicago. Uh, 
they have praised him for a perspectives piece in the New England Journal of Medicine in which Dr. Winnie had calls for civil disobedience by physicians through ignoring laws restricting abortion. I responded, posting that in his piece, Matt never mentioned the fetus and that whether civil disobedience of the form he calls for is just depends on whether the fetus deserves the moral regard of not killing it. Dr. Winnie responded with one of the two standard ways of waving away the question of the fetus. He wrote, quote, I don't know when exactly human life begins and neither does anyone else. Now, and then he followed that with the, the notion that there's some people who want to impose their views on others. <clears throat> it, this, this statement by him, of course, is not true. Uh, Matt is really smart. He knows biology, he knows embryology. He would not be at all perplexed about when the life of a, any other organism begins. And if it were true, then he also knows that the precautionary principle holds, that, that if it may be that a human life has begun, then one has at least prima facie reasons to not act in ways that would kill that human being. I pointed this out in a posting and Dr. Winnie did not respond further, displaying the pattern among bioethicists of declining, and this is, this is I, I confront this um, frequently, declining to reason together about whether life has begun or about whether the fetus deserves moral regard. Bioethicists as Dr. Winnie did, demur with a kind of what I would think of as a false humility, a kind of that's above my pay grade uh, claim. Larry McCullough, another very well-known uh, senior bioethicist who with Frank Chervenak has written the most influential papers and books on medical ethics for OBGYNs, then posted and displayed the second standard way of waving away the question of the fetus. Far, he wrote, you make valid if-then statement. If we owe the fetus serious moral regard, then the connection between abortion and justice becomes fragile or even non-existent. The problems for this position begin with two stubborn facts. One, there is no universal agreement on the moral status of the fetus between religions, within religions, and between religious and secular philosophical reasoning. Two, there is no method for resolving these intractable differences. He then added a third problem, that professional ethics in medicine is secular, which means that professional <coughs> ethics in medicine has no method for resolving the millennia-old disagreement about the moral status of the fetus. I posted pointing out that neither Larry nor anyone else in the world of bioethics applies such standards to any other issue. We only disagree and debate issues about which there is no universal consensus. If universal agreement were what we need to justify some ethical conclusion, we wouldn't have the field of, bio, of ethics, uh, bioethics or ethics generally, because we would already agree universally, by definition, on how to order our public and professional lives. If universal moral agreement were the bar for showing basic regard to one class of human beings, we would never have seen the abolition of slavery. We've never seen women's suffrage, civil rights, rights for the disabled, rights for vulnerable research subjects, nor much of anything else that was achieved despite long and seemingly intractable disagreement. So in effect, the question of the fetus is avoided by dissolving it into the question of whether abortion is, all things considered, permissible. It seems to me that the claim that there's no consensus about when life begins is used as a euphemism for there is no consensus about whether it is reasonable for us to kill the fetus. And the claim that there is no universal consensus about the moral status of the fetus becomes a euphemism for it. there is no universal consensus about whether abortion is, all things considered, ethical. It seems to me that those who've decided abortion is necessary and permissible, which of course these bioethicists have, have thereby persuaded themselves, and I, I think sometimes this is unconscious um, or subconscious, they persuaded themselves that no one can know when life begins. After all, if they could know when life begins, they would have uh, to argue that the fetus is not alive. They'd have to show why that's a reasonable conclusion, and no such arguments are available. And I, if they were available, they would be made, and they're not made. Uh, 
they would, they persuaded themselves also that no one can know whether the fetus deserves moral regard at, because after all, if they could know, they would have to argue that the fetus does not. And such arguments tend to look conspicuously arbitrary. In an essay published more than 30 years ago titled Personhood in the Bioethics Literature, the philosopher and bioethicist Ruth Macklin, who did not and still does not oppose abortion, observed that the great majority of efforts to define personhood have occurred within debates about abortion, where those who support abortion justify it by defining personhood in such a way that fetuses do not have it. That's 30 years ago. In their textbook, The Principles of Biomedical Ethics, Beecham and Childress described five different and incompatible theories of moral status in the bioethics literature. And they add, quote, the worry today is that some groups, especially vulnerable groups, they mention fetuses particularly, may still be in a discriminatory social situation. They fail to satisfy criteria of moral status precisely because the dominant criteria have been tailored specifically to deny them partial or full moral status. So bioethicists are aware that they do not have, this is my proposal to you, they're aware they do not have non-arbitrary criteria by which to conclude that human fetuses do not deserve the basic moral regard we owe to all other human beings. They just, they recognize there are no winning arguments on that score. If there were, they would advance them. In the end, this pattern of ignoring the fetus implies that the personhood of the fetus is conspicuous. That even to say or to write the words, the fetus, is to bring into view one who conspicuously demands moral regard. Not just a something, but a, a someone. And this suggests that clinicians who cooperate with abortion have to sustain a double consciousness regarding the fetus. While clinicians characteristically pay exquisite attention to the fetus so as not to, to harm it, abortion requires them to forget the fetus, acting and speaking as if the fetus has disappeared into the pregnancy. So think about it. E even physicians who support elective abortion do not disregard the fetus in other contexts. They care for women routinely. Women, physicians who care for women routinely take great care not to harm the developing fetus. They sometimes refuse to prescribe medications that are known to cause birth defects unless the patient's willing to commit to using contraceptives. They use careful shields against radiation when taking radiographic images. They even use alternative imaging modalities to avoid radiation altogether. Whenever possible, when caring for pregnant women, they choose medication alternatives that are less risky for the health of the fetus. Physicians have even developed methods of preserving and restoring the fetus's health by, through in utero surgeries. So there's a double consciousness insofar as the characteristic actions of physicians are to regard the fetus as, as uh, you know, an other that, that must be protected. And then abortion, one has to sort of take the fetus entirely out of, out of view and act as if it doesn't exist at all. Ignoring the fetus whose personhood is conspicuous, I think, makes defenses and practices of abortion arbitrary and unstable. To claim that it's unethical to restrict abortion while ignoring the fetus merely begs the question. And to cooperate in destroying the fetus while declining to name what it is that one is destroying requires a kind of self-deception. In the end, by not naming the fetus, those who defend abortion implicitly concede that fetuses appear to be persons. Thanks. I'd like to begin with uh, an acknowledgement of Professor David Solomon here, one of my most important professors at Notre Dame. I think he deserves a round of applause just for being here. So I'm going to look at the September uh, 2022 Commonweal Magazine response to the Dobbs decision. It features an all-black cover with ominous red lettering, that, which reads, abortion after Dobbs. And the essays on the topic of overturning Roe versus Wade reflect, for the most part, the cover's gloomy take on the end of Roe. Massimo Faccioli's contribution repeatedly mentions that under fascist dictatorship, 
abortion was legally forbidden, as if this fact calls into question pro-life laws. Now, in fact, all people of goodwill agree that fascism is wrong, but that in no way undermines legislation against abortion. It would be equally fallacious to argue that totalitarian communist dictatorships like Khrushchev's legalized abortion. So if you oppose Soviet-style totalitarian dictatorships, then you must support strong pro-life legislation. Such reasoning exemplifies the genetic fallacy. The origin of a belief, or for that matter, a law, does not determine the truth of that belief or the justice of that law. Although on numerous other issues, Fajoli provides fulsome defense of Pope Francis, he is silent about Pope Francis's frequent remark, including after the overturning of Roe, that abortion is like hiring a hitman to solve a problem. Now, presumably, fascist and communist regimes alike outlaw hiring hitmen. But this fact does not count against the justice of such a law in those regimes or in a democracy. At stake is whether, in hopes of solving some serious problem, an individual can lawfully use lethal violence against an innocent human being. Another contributor to the Commonweal Symposium was a former professor here, uh, now a professor at the University of Notre Dame, uh, Kathy Cavani. Now, she criticizes uh, the argument against abortion from analogy to slavery. And she says, there was no moral good to be preserved on the pro-slavery side. Human beings cannot be owned. They cannot be treated as merely instruments of the will of another. In the slavery debate, the moral balance was neither necessary nor possible. But abortion is different. Here, both sides of the debate perceive genuine uh, goods. A woman's bodily integrity and moral autonomy is a good. Protecting fetal life is a good." Unquote. Now, it is true that human beings ought not to be owned and that they shouldn't be treated as merely instruments or property under the total control and will of another. But this principle is also at stake in abortion. One human being, vulnerable and dependent, is treated as a disposable means as if she were merely property to be destroyed and discarded by another. Indeed, the laws of some countries treat human embryos precisely as properties. You see this in some uh, cases of in vitro fertilization, where you have frozen embryos and there's uh, legal disputes about who owns them. Now, of course, a woman's bodily integrity and moral autonomy are goods, just as a person's right to own property and exercise free choice in what they buy and sell are goods. But these goods are limited by the basic rights of other human beings, whether they be black human beings or unborn human beings. Just as the legal right to property ought not to include the right to buy and sell human beings, so too the legal right to control one's own body ought not to include the right to intentionally kill human beings prior to birth or after birth. The right to bodily integrity, if it's a human right, is enjoyed by all human beings. And the right to bodily integrity is violated by abortion, which, at least as typically done, violently undermines the bodily integrity of a human being prior to birth. So we cannot appeal to a right of bodily integrity to justify most abortions, since a right of bodily integrity is itself violated in most abortions. Another contribution to the uh, Commonweal Symposium was given by George Scalaba in his contribution, The High Price of Dobbs. And he begins with a straightforward assertion. At no point in the first and second trimesters, nor in the third, when the mother's life or health is at stake, does the fetus, sans thoughts, sans emotions, sans experiences, sans everything, have any rights that override those of the woman, unquote. Now, he does not clarify why having thoughts or emotions or experiences is necessary for having a right to live, nor whether these markers are also necessary for unconscious adults to have a right to live. He continues, millions of Americans think differently, and this is a source of puzzlement and distress to me, as well as, I hope, humility. But with all the goodwill I can muster, I'm unable to find any plausibility in their view. Now, some puzzles are easy to solve. For all those people of goodwill, with humility to understand the rational basis 
for what millions of Americans and Pope Francis and the Catholic Church hold, may I suggest that he and others read at least one of the following books, Abortion and Unborn Human Life by Patrick Lee, The Ethics of Pregnancy, Abortion, and Childbirth by Helen Watt, as well as my own recently released third edition of The Ethics of Abortion, all these books make a case based on reason, evidence, and logic without appeal at all to revelation, to faith, to scripture, that all human beings deserve basic human rights, both before birth and after birth. None of these works in any way is a theological work. Now, Skilaba simply ignores all these pro-life books and all, there's many others and many other articles as well. And these works provide reasons and evidence that are acceptable to people of goodwill that do not rely on religious faith. Now, it is, of course, true that many who fight for the defense of all human beings are people of faith. And this was also true of the devout William Wilberforce, whose evangelical Christian conversion led him to fight for decades and against all odds against legalized slavery. This was also true of many people of faith who advocated for full civil rights in the United States in the 1960s, including the Reverend Martin Luther King Jr. The rationality and the justice of advocating for full protection of the law for all human beings is not in the least undermined because this advocacy is done by people of faith. Another contribution to the Commonweal Symposium is by Lisa Fulham, and she says, Women with ectopic pregnancies are not treated until their lives are on the cusp of being lost because of pro-life legislation. But as Alexandra DeSanctis notes, she says, I took it upon myself to read every pro-life law currently in place, and I compiled my findings into an article published on the National Review homepage yesterday. My findings, every pro-life law has an explicit exception allowing doctors to exercise their medical judgment and perform necessary procedures if a mother's life's at risk. Many of the laws also contain a section noting explicitly that ectopic pregnancy and post-miscarriage treatment are not classified as abortion procedures. Now, there are a number of ways to treat ectopic pregnancies that are fully compatible with the moral and legal protection of human life prior to birth. And if you want to talk about that in the question and answer period, I've written about that a little bit and I can share my views with you if you'd like. Fulham also points out that poor and disadvantaged women will not be able to get abortions, but rich and privileged women will. Now this disparity is true of abortion law, but it's also true of traffic law. Rich and privileged women are presumably able to skirt around tickets for running red lights much more easily than poor and disadvantaged women. Likewise, rich and privileged women are presumably able to avoid paying income tax more easily than the poor. And this disparity of enforcement and an ability to avoid legal requirements are always in play in every law, including laws about murder, as O.J. Simpson's legal team taught us. So these conditions pose no unique problem for laws of equal protection of human beings prior to birth. Fulham also writes, let's take biology seriously. While an embryo from conception does have different DNA from its mother, it's also true from implantation until viability, the developing fetus is intimately and exclusively bound to the mother. Those giant posters of apparently free floating fetuses seen at pro-life rallies sell a biological fiction. There is no such thing as a living developing fetus that is not utterly dependent on the well-being of its mother. Now this is a straw man critique. No intelligent person seeing a photograph of a human being in utero thinks this individual is giant or free floating. <laughs> Every intelligent person also knows the prenatal human being is intimately bound and utterly dependent on his or her mother. But what moral significance do these facts have? Is being dependent and vulnerable a reason to discount, discount the value of an individual? Catholic moral theology and sound philosophical reasoning does not engage in such discounting. Human beings who are weak, poor, unwanted have equal basic dignity as human beings who are strong, rich, and desirable. 
Indeed, a proper conception of social justice puts a priority on caring for those who are most vulnerable, unloved, and dependent. As Vice President Hubert Humphrey pointed out, it was once said that the moral test of government is how the government treats those who were in the dawn of life, the children, those who are in the twilight of life, the elderly, and those who are in the shadows of life, the sick, the needy, and the handicapped. The vulnerability and dependence of the weakest among us call us to care, love, and support them. In particular, mothers and fathers have a serious duty to provide support and care for their own minor dependent sons and daughters. So Fulham's case for abortion ends up justifying not just abortion, but a wholesale rejection of the most fundamental principle of Catholic moral theology, the inherent dignity and value of every human being. And this principle, to reject this principle is to reject the gospel as found in every word and action of Jesus of Nazareth. In what Jesus said and what Jesus did, he taught us, nobody is a nobody. The weakest, the lowest, the smallest, the most vulnerable, the most despised of human beings is loved by God. And those who love God love everyone without exception. So to deny any human being this consideration is to deny the teaching of Jesus. It is also to deny human rights, the rights enjoyed by all individuals simply in virtue of their humanity. It's to reject the most famous American principle. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal. And contrary to some commentators, this principle, at least as understood by Thomas Jefferson and other founders like John Adams, includes all human beings, anyone with human nature. Fulham continues her critique. In keeping with the Catholic principle of subsidiarity, shouldn't these decisions be made by those closest to them, the pregnant woman, her partner, and the physician? Now, the principle of subsidiarity is an important aspect of Catholic social thought. But as St. John Paul II pointed out, the guiding principle of Pope Leo's encyclical Rerum Novarum and of all the church's social doctrine is a correct view of the human person and his unique value. So the principle of subsidiarity rests upon, as a foundation, the dignity of the human person. So if human persons don't have dignity, why should we respect their decisions? To invoke the principle of subsidiarity as a justification for killing an innocent person, the most radical denial possible of an individual's dignity, involves a fundamental contradiction. Respect for individual persons affected by a decision is a condition for the possibility of the principle of subsidiarity. So there's an inher inherent incoherence in using the principle of subsidiarity to justify killing vulnerable human persons. Fulham continues her critique. Further, rape and incest must be allowed as justifications for legal termination of pregnancy if the woman wishes. Otherwise, we, we are in effect allowing a man to legally commandeer a woman's body for nine months, after which she is faced with the agonizing choice of whether to raise or to give up for adoption a child conceived by violence, who is the child of her attacker and is also her own. This. Fulham says, is a violation of the person of, of women. Now, even in countries with very strong pro-life laws, a man is not allowed, allowed to legally commandeer a woman's body for nine months. In some cases, a rapist may be dead or imprisoned, so is unable even to see the woman in question, let alone commandeer her body. But it is true that evil people can force innocent people into agonizing choices between doing evil and suffering evil. King Henry VIII forced St. Thomas More to choose between acknowledging the king as head of the church in England or facing martyrdom and beheading. The rapist who impregnates his victim forces a woman to choose between aborting an innocent son or daughter or enduring an unwanted pregnancy. And there's simply no denying the heartbreaking agony of such situations in which evil people force innocent people to choose between moral evil and heroic goodness. Now to rape someone is to undermine their freedom and to harm them very seriously. To rape someone is intrinsically evil. It's an act that should never be done to anyone in any circumstances. Likewise, to abort someone is to undermine someone's freedom entirely 
and to harm the individual in the most serious way by depriving him or her of any chance to enjoy any goods of this life. The woman who carries the, preg who carries the pregnancy to term acts in radical contradiction to the actions of her attacker. Rather than taking freedom away, she gives freedom. Rather than harming the vulnerable, she helps the vulnerable. Rather than do something intrinsically evil, she does something heroically good. As Martin Luther King Jr. said, returning violence for violence multiplies violence, adding deeper darkness to a night already devoid of stars. Darkness cannot drive out darkness. Only light can do that. Hate cannot drive out hate. Only love can do that. And that's what we're called to. We're called to love. We're called to love the unborn. We're called to love all the women who have crisis pregnancies. And we're called to love those with whom we disagree, those people who think abortion is just fine. And it can seem at times as if this is an insurmountable struggle. You might think, oh, look at all these votes we're losing on the, on the pro-life side. It's you know, happening again and again. But I'd like you to remember what happened with same-sex marriage. Same-sex marriage advocates lost time and time again in popular votes. And in 42 out of 50 states, same-sex marriage was illegal. So I don't want anyone here to think that things are hopeless, that you know, this can't be overcome, that there's no way to move forward. There is a way to move forward. And each and every one of us has a very important role to play, each of us having a different role. But I want to encourage you today to take up your role in this fight and to make sure that at some point in the future, we're a country where every human being is protected by law and also welcomed in life. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. The Supreme Court of the United States landmark decision in Dobbs versus Jackson Women's Health was handed down on June 24, 2022, striking down nearly the 50-year-old decision of Roe v. Wade and its grant of a practically unlimited abortion license. That decision has fundamentally remade the landscape of abortion law. In reading the Supreme Court majority opinion, concurring opinions, and dissenting opinion, as well as the responses of major medical organizations via their journals and websites, a most striking feature is the difference in the way biological, moral, and legal status of the fetus at the heart of the abortion controversy is addressed or not. The fetus was, the, was an object of reasoning in a majority opinion in Roe, Planned Parenthood versus Casey and Dobbs. It is nearly absent from a minority dissent and completely missing from the responses in major medical journals and organizations. As the Dobbs majority opinion rightly asks, quote, how can that be, end quote, it is akin to attempting to discuss the details of an appendectomy without mentioning the appendix or a myocardial infarction without using the term heart. There cannot be any meaningful discussion of abortion without naming or addressing the fetus of the status, the status of the fetus. But alas, that is the point. Such an omerta of, of, of omission is not accidental, it is intentional. Choosing not to address the inconvenient truth that the fetus is alive is a second patient and should be an ethical and legal party in any decision about an abortion represents a willful blindness. It is emblematic of a triumph of ideology over medical science. For if we are to fully understand the concept of choice in the context of abortion, it is imperative that we be extremely clear about what science tells us about what the choice entails. The Supreme Court minor majority decision in Dobbs specifically overturned a lower court ruling that had blocked the implementation of Missouri's Gestational Age Act, which banned, with some medical exceptions, abortions after 15 weeks of probable gestational age. More importantly, in doing so, it overturned the Supreme Court precedents of Roe v. Casey, the pair of decisions which had both defined and limited lawmaking and debate on abortion for nearly 50 years. Written by Justice Samuel Alito, the majority opinion is a masterful rendering of the law, ethics, and medicine involved in the abortion debate. Its landmark main holding is as follows, quote, the Constitution does not confer a right to abortion. Roe and Casey must be overruled, and the authority to regulate abortion is returned to the people and their elected representatives, end quote. The court's basis for that holding was threefold. Number one, the Constitution provides no explicit or implicit protection of abortion. Number two, any purported right to abortion 
would have to be rooted in this nation's history and tradition and be an essential component of ordered liberty. Neither condition holds for abortion. And thirdly, the issue, thus the issue of abortion must be returned to the people's elected representatives, quote, like most important questions in our democracy, end quote. What I want to focus on is how the opinion and the reaction to it characterize the biological basis of pregnancy and thus abortion, the unborn child, also known as the fetus. I will focus on the latter term, as it is both scientific until just very recently non-controversial and eminently mentionable. In summarizing the findings of Roe and Casey in its syllabus, the Dobbs decision notes that each struck a particular balance between the interests of a woman who wants an abortion and the interests of what they term potential life. Shortly thereafter, the majority gets to the heart of the matter, quote, what sharply distinguishes the abortion right from the rights recognized on the cases on which Roe and Casey rely is something that both these decisions acknowledge. Abortion destroys what those decisions call potential life and what the law at issue in this case regards as the life of an unborn human being, end quote. None of the other decisions cited by Roe and Casey involve the critical moral questioning posed by abortion. All three decisions, Roe, Casey, and Dobbs, reference this in similar language multiple times. In contrast, the minority dissenting opinion barely mentions the fetus or even potential life. When it does, it is only to recount the prior cases and not as any part of its own reasoning. As the majority states, quote, the most striking feature of the dissent is the absence of any serious discussion of the legitimacy of the state's interest in protecting fetal life. Let us turn now to the responses of major medical organizations and journals to see if mention of the fetus might be found there, as we should think they would be the experts on the biological reality of pregnancy in the fetus. The American College of Obstetrics and Gynecology statement appeared several days after this decision remains unchanged. The statement by the ACOG president, Ifata Abbasi Hoskins, called Dobbs, quote, a direct blow to bodily autonomy, reproductive health, patient safety, and health equity, end quote. But of course, she's not talking about the fetus, for whom abortion is a lethal bodily assault, the end of reproduction and health, the antithesis of patient safety, and the ultimate inequity. She complains that the state-based abortion restrictions being promulgated in the wake of Dobbs, quote, are not based on science or medicine, end quote. But then she continues to discuss abortion without mentioning the fetus, whose existence as an entity was until very recently recognized by medical science. The only parties worthy of mention in her discussion are a woman and her doctor for whom, quote, this is a dark and dangerous time, end quote. There is also the current obligatory rhetorical tick of arguing uh, from an argument of inequity, sorry, um, that citing the um, additional barriers faced by people of color, rural residents, and the poor, but still no consideration of the fetus. In addition, any possible restriction on abortion is dismissed as an imposition of, quote, religious or ideological views on others, end quote. But acknowledging the fact of the existence of the fetus is not, by refusing to acknowledge the fact it is of turning a blind eye to the fetus is ideology, not science. An inconvenient fact which testifies to the willful nature of Hoskins' blindness to the fetus is her self-reported career choice. She's a fellowship-trained maternal fetal medicine subspecialist. In either advocating for or performing abortions, she and a significant number of her fellow OBGYNs have knowingly, stridently, and mercilessly abandoned half of their patients. Among all physicians, maternal fetal medicine specialists should best understand that a mother and her unborn child are so much more than two strangers tempor uh, temporarily sharing a body. They share an incredible life-giving bond that is severed by abortion. Ironically, ACOG has a beautiful logo in the style of a classical statue of a mother treasuring a live infant she holds aloft. The logo would imply that ACOG is, or historically was, concerned with the welfare of mothers and babies. Yet the organization's current policies neglect the latter, and nowhere in their statements on abortion is baby or fetus even mentioned. So perhaps the logo would more accurately be this. And as ACOG, in fealty the transgender craze, has stopped using the word women in most of its statements and published papers, the mother's going to have to go as well. My bet is this logo will not survive this decade. Pediatricians would seemingly have no possible division of interest when considering the status of the unborn child. 
If nothing else, more children should be good for their practices. The American Academy of Pediatrics stridently disagrees. The AAP's journal published a written commentary by Dob on Dobbs by AMA President Morris Salaji. It focused extensively on adolescent patients and laments the increased barriers it is assumed they will face in accents, accessing comprehensive reproductive health care services and abortion care. The AAP holds that limiting these services after row threatens the health and safety of our patients, a statement that is abjectly false in regard to the fetus and problematic at best in the case of the adolescent. The existence, health, and safety of the fetus and unborn child is of no apparent interest to the American Academy of Pediatrics. It is worth noting that the AAP defines adolescents as ages 11 through 21, and the organization holds that abortion, access to abortion should not need parental consent. The prospect of an 11-year-old girl making the decision to have an abortion without parental involvement should be shocking. What also should be shocking to the AAP is the relative number of abortions compared to all-cause infant mortality. Just this past Wednesday, the 2022 infant mortality data was released. This applies to babies younger than one year. Regrettably, it showed an increase in the infant mortality rate for the first time in 20 years. These deaths totaled over 20,000. The AAP devotes considerable ad educational advocacy efforts to decreasing that number. But for 2020, the latest year for which data is available, the Guttmacher Institute estimates there are 930,000 deaths from abortion, 46 times more than for all other causes. For them, the AAP has nary a word. In another symbolic irony, the AAP's logo is based on the famous Della Robbia terracotta medallions um, that were crafted in the 1400s on the Ospedale degli Innocente, which is Florence's foundling hospital. Um, they were based on the infant Jesus with his arms in a position of supplication or help in need of aid on a hospital dedicated to the memory of the holy innocents. All this is apparently anathema to the leadership of the modern AAP. This Bambino, too, is unlikely to survive the decade. The American Medical Association also issued a statement from its president responding to Dobbs. In it, Jack Resnick, Jr., a San Francisco dermatologist, takes a similar stance as the other organizations. It starts with a large dose of chutzpah and calling the ruling, quote, an assault, end quote, a term that more accurately describes an abortion. Abortion, the negation of reproduction, is called a reproductive health service a claim that, quote, cannot be ignored, end quote. Resnick laments the fact that, quote, sharp political divisions have always clouded the issue of abortion and made substantive conversations difficult, end quote. He appears not to realize there can be no substantive conversation about abortion without a realistic acknowledgment of the substance that is being aborted, that is a fetus. This contagion of willful moral blindness has apparently spread across all organized medicine as once again, the existence of the fetus is not even mentioned in the relentless service their pro-abortion ideology. By denying the bio of the fetus, they presumably do not need to address it ethically. This position is evidence ignorant rather than evidence based and is the polar opposite of science. The New England Journal of Medicine's post editorial was entitled Lawmakers versus the Scientific Realities of Human Reproduction. It raises many objections to Dobbs, which contain neither science nor reality. But for an article ostensibly presenting the scientific realities, the most important one, that every abortion results in the death of a fetus, is studiously ignored. The fetus is once again not even mentioned. The piece decries Dobbs as a stunning reversal of precedent while neglecting the equally stunning reversal of precedent that Roe itself imposed on state abortion laws. The editors employ the odious oxymoron, quote, abortion care, end quote, the jarring juxtaposition of two words, therefore euphemizing the moral scandal that is abortion by masquerading it as care. There is no caring for the fetus in abortion. There is only death, death willfully unacknowledged by the editorial as the fetus is not mentioned. The editors bewail recent state laws as denials of Americans' reproductive autonomy and fear they will create a, quote, Orwellian dystopia, end quote. Their notion of autonomy includes only the mother and the abortion practitioner. If invoking George Orwell implies that abortion restrictions are totalitarian, then what are the fetus being left voiceless and subject to destruction in what should be the safest of all places? Orwell understood that control of language is control of thought. Attempting to make the fetus unmentionable is an attempt to make it undeserving of medical, moral, or legal status or of duty to care. 
Unashamedly, the authors declare that for nearly 50 years, Americans have lived under, quote, the protection of Roe v. Wade, end quote. There is nothing protective for unborn children under Roe. The editors then lament that while other countries around the world are codifying protect protections for reproductive decision making for their citizens, the United States is, quote, turning the clock backward to take these rights away from our citizens, end quote. While a general worldwide trend has been towards the liberalization of abortion laws, most of these laws still restrict abortion more than a practically unlimited license that was granted under Roe. The editors end with an argument from inequity, which is de rigueur for any medical issue these days. Quote, currently proposed changes in our laws will most be most burdensome and unfair to the low-income persons and persons of color who are least able to or overcome the impediments placed in their paths. So it is a problem that certain groups are unable to access med the medical and moral evil that is abortion at the same rate as others? Is not the current state where the abortion rate is 3.6 times higher for black women than for white women a problem? In any, any other context, such a difference in death rates would and should be considered a scandal. In all these statements, a lethal procedure is obfuscated by a word salad of non sequiturs, care, protection, rights, justice, equity, evidence-based. So here we see the strategy of the pro-abortion movement, the Supreme Court not minority, all of big medicine, and most of our secular culture. The fetus is not even a thing anymore. Both medicine and the public must be always shielded from the disturbing implications of its existence. It has been deemed unfit for polite company. It is impossible to debate the bioethics or anthropology of embodiment if abortion advocates refuse to recognize that a fetal body even exists. What can be done to counter this canceling? We must insist on the primary primacy of science, beginning with the fact that the embryo and later the fetus is a biological reality. We must hold our organizations and journals to account. Let us remember the ontogeny of pregnancy. Pregnancy is not an independent physiologic process willed by the mother that might come to contain and provide for a biological entity called the fetus. Every aspect results from the implantation uh, from the creation implantation of an embryo. This embryo directs its own biochemical development in the, development in the profound changes of its maternal host. That single cell has the radical capacity not only for somatic growth but for rationality. It is probably the mightiest cell in the world. Abortion is not the mere termination of a pregnancy with the resulting secondary death of an embryo or fetus. Abortion is, indeed it has to be, the deliberate destruction of a fetus which results in the end of a pregnancy. That is the goal and method of the pro-abortion movement. Pregnancy persists until the fetus is dead. We must resist all attempts to hide this reality. In this ugly age of shocking campaigns like Shout Your Abortion, the fetus is currently a missing person, largely unseen and always voiceless. With the aid of ultrasound, DNA, facial recognition, and other emerging technologies, a goal of the pro-life movement must continue to be making the fetus seen and heard and missing no more, so it cannot be ignored by anyone of goodwill with eyes to see and ears to hear. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks to all three of you. Those were excellent. If you've got questions, please um, line up. The moderator has questions, but he will defer to the audience. Thank you so much for these uh, uh, presentations. Uh, I'm a, an Austrian legal scholar and a moral theologian, so, and I've been fighting for, the, um, for unborn life and the moral status of the embryo for the last, for all my academic life. Uh, so my question is more, how should we go forward? You know, I think uh, the big question now is, should we criminalize women who have had abortions or attempt abortions? What is your legal, political proposal after Dobbs? Uh, I mean, I, I would say no, we shouldn't um, for prudential reasons. Um, that would, it's not necessary, it's not, it's not the most direct route to stopping abortion and it would lead to a tremendous backlash that would undermine um, the efforts to 
reduce abortion. It seems to me part of the challenge today is for people who oppose, who, people like, I, I suspect, the three of us who believe that it's always unreasonable to intentionally kill an innocent human being, um, to accept laws that allow for some innocent human beings to be killed, but but reduce the number and, and the scope of that. Um, and it seems to me that, that we have to accept, at least provisionally, laws that are possible um, in this political context. I would say an incremental approach probably is best. So it's gonna depend on what state you're in. If you're in California, you might wanna to try to ban infanticide. Probably can't get a majority on that, but we could try. Um, but in other states, you can make real progress. And I think when you talk about criminalizing women, that is definitely not the right way to go. The crime should be uh, directed against the abortionist, not the woman who's getting the abortion. She is, in a way, a second victim. And in many, many cases, uh, the women getting abortions are not really aware fully of what's going on and what the fetal development's like, et cetera. By contrast, a medical uh, professional can and should know the facts of embryology, and so it makes more sense to make the crime what that person does, not what the, what the woman does. The laws are gonna, well, laws are gonna lag behind uh, changes in the culture. Um, I'm not optimistic about changes in the culture lately, um, especially you know, recently seeing reaction to you know, some of the atrocities that were committed in Israel with the blase of many people to the, the intentional death of, of babies there. But for now, that's our only hope, is to make sure that um, we can, that, that uh, as much as possible, we can make the fetus visible and like crisis pregnancy centers, which leverage ultrasound to um, allow a woman to um, see their baby, I think are steps in the right direction, but a lot more of that needs to be done. So, uh, Mark Cherry from Texas. Uh, Far, I actually have counterexamples for you for the beginning of your questions, but we can talk about those later. I, I have a question about uh, rhetorical language. Uh, I noticed in much of the talks the missing unborn child. We talked about the missing fetus. We didn't talk about the missing unborn child. For non-specialists, the fetus doesn't mean much. Uh, you talk to people in your parishes and so forth, it's hard for them to understand what's going on with the fetus. Everybody understands the missing unborn child, not to mention, uh, or the unborn child, not to mention that it's a way of really drawing attention to the humanity uh, of the child, of the unborn child, of the developing child. So it's just as a suggestion in terms of making language more powerful for non-specialist audience, you, you might think about uh, adding that in, at least in some, one place or another. Just a thought. Yeah, I think you're right. The, the way we speak about the unborn is, is really important. The way I prefer to talk about it is a, a human being prior to birth or a prenatal human being or a human being in utero. And the reason I, I prefer that kind of language is that this is scientifically medically accurate. I mean, if you say to someone, well, what species is this individual living organism? Uh, you know, from a scientific perspective, someone does have to admit, okay, yes, it's a human being. It's a human a member of our species. So that's the way I like to talk about it, because in certain debates, at least, if you say child, the person says, well, I don't recognize the personhood or whatever. Whereas I think, if they're honest, they can't really deny that this is a living human being prior to birth or an unborn human being. So that's the language I tend to use uh, in most contexts to talk about this. I'll just say briefly that in, in the, the legal cases that I've been involved in, the plaintiffs have alleged that the laws which use the language of unborn child are problematic because that's not scientific language. Um, it's kind of silly. I mean, uh, and in fact, if you look up child, you know, you, you, the definitions are, uh, it, it's not unscientific to describe the fetus as a child. And in fact, as, as you're suggesting, and this is the characteristic in the clinical context, people in any situation except abortion. So you, in any situation where the woman's pregnant uh, except abortion, they don't talk about the fetus, they talk about the baby. Hi, thank you guys very much. Um, I kind of have a twofold question for you guys about the fact that the fetus isn't mentioned. Um, well, I was hearing some of your quotes from the, the health organizations or the people who were responding to Dobbs. One of the things I was thinking was, in some ways, those places seem to be responding to a lot of social pressure to make a statement against Dobbs. To me. And so I was wondering um, 
how should bioethicists, clinicians, practitioners, how should they respond to something like cultural polarization and social pressure where maybe everybody's clamoring for this one place, like you've got to make a statement about Dobbs, you have to say how bad this is, and people just kind of caving to that. Um, whereas if you don't say something or if you oppose it, suddenly you're put in these two different camps that seem like they're never going to talk to one another. Um, so how should, how should people in your guys' shoes of bioethicists who are trying to have this conversation, how can you bridge that gap? Um, I guess, uh, I'm blank, blanking for a second about that. I'm blanking for a second about that crap. I think it's important to, in situations where there's a, a group setting, people can have um, a misimpression that everyone in the group agrees with whatever, being thinking Dobbs is a terrible decision. And so because there's this impression that, oh, the group already is, there's a consensus, everyone's decided, people can move forward even though there may be actually some people there who do not agree. So I do think that courage is required in cases to say, look, you know, I appreciate your perspective, but I really do think X, Y, and Z, whatever it is you think, because the illusion of consensus is something that's only punctured by someone having the courage to speak up, and and that can be enough sometimes to have other people who are a little more afraid and timid come out and say, oh, oh yeah, I think so too, I think so too, and then it became it can become clear that there really is not a consensus, that there's a significant group that dissents from the idea that Dobbs is a terrible decision, and that may be enough to cause a statement to be scuttled, or it could be enough to, if there's a statement for the statement to be mitigated and watered down and made more reasonable in virtue of the fact that uh, if the statement's supposed to represent the group, there are people in the group who strongly feel the opposite way. So I think both those things do require courage, though, and I'd encourage you or anybody else who's in a situation like that, don't be afraid of being the only person in the room who has this perspective and saying it, saying it with charity, but saying it firmly with conviction. Because, again, chances are great that there's others around who may feel the same way but just lack your conviction. I'm sorry. I'll come back to what I was going to say. Is the, um, I purposely just dealt with ACOG, American Academy of Pediatrics, American Medical Association, because they should have an opinion on Dobbs. Unfortunately, they have the wrong one. But, so I would expect them. I don't view the, that those statements are gratuitous. They should be. What I, didn't leave, what I left out was there. I stopped counting, like 40 different other medical organizations all chimed in on Dobbs, including dermatologists, the American Academy of Neurology, all these people that shouldn't, groups that shouldn't have to have an opinion on it, but they're being forced by the culture, the medical culture, to have an opinion against Dobbs. And I admire the medical left for their message discipline because they have everyone uh, singing from the same hymn book. Hi, thank you so much for for your uh, presentations. I'm Javier de Cendra, Dean of the Faculty of Law, Business and Government at University Francisco de Vitoria in Madrid. And just yesterday I was um, giving a paper which is very much related to yours on legal ontology, the concepts of human person, human dignity, personhood and so on, and issues of right to life and abortion. So very much on, on point. And uh, we of course had to discuss the reaction in Europe many mem member states of the European Union and the EU itself to DOPS. And we saw the European Parliament, for instance, passed a resolution through majority, not legally binding, but very important, saying that indeed the uh, Council in Europe should promote a legislation, a modification of the Charter of Fundamental Rights of the EU to ensure that abortion is seen as a right. So. That's the EU, but then I was looking at various member states and in Spain, the Constitutional Court said the same um, in May 2023 and made a reference to Dobbs and said that was completely wrong and guaranteed the full right to abortion. So my, my question now is the following. Um, what all the lawyers, all the lawyers in those courts, in those parliaments and so on, are coming obviously from law schools, many of them are secular law schools, where they are accepting without any questioning the positive law or the statements of those uh, legally and democratically elected institutions. So Catholic universities, Catholic law schools, should be doing something in terms of explaining law and legal ontology 
so as to give enough arguments about the protection of life. And my question precisely is then, do you feel or what do you know or what do you think about what Catholic or Christian law schools in this country are doing to explain properly the philosophical, the ontological, the metaphysical, if you want, and the scientific um, truths uh, about the right to life, about human dignity and human personhood. Because I would, I would say that when we talk about education as a starting point, it has to be very precise. What do we say in the classroom? So what views do you have about that? Thank you very much. Well, I know there's one law school that's doing a fantastic job <laughs> at doing that. And I can't remember, it's not coming to mind, but it's somewhere nearby, I think. So, uh, no, there's all kinds of people right here at Notre Dame that are doing absolutely fantastic work on this topic. I mean, many different scholars. And so I think uh, really Notre Dame is a leading light of how to do this. And the great thing about Notre Dame also is that not only are they doing all this great work, but they're extremely well regarded you know, in the legal profession. So it's, it's really uh, fantastic, and I'm extremely grateful to what Notre Dame's doing. I do wish that other Catholic universities would take a page out of Notre Dame's book, and I've been trying to do that out west where I am, and haven't been 100% successful, let's say. Um, but I think the fact that Notre Dame is doing so well really is an encouragement to others. Now, there are some smaller law schools in the United States that uh, are similar, but none quite has the prestige and the influence of, of Notre Dame. So I'm going to play panelists for one second. Just out of the gratitude and loyalty, and because of the convener of um, this occasion, I should say that Carter Sneed was a national hero on this. I mean, he was everywhere at once. He was in every interview, on every podcast, in every major publication, absolutely tireless. From the moment that the court granted cert in Dobbs, a moment at which almost everybody on both sides of the issue thought for sure they're not going to overturn Roe. They're going to give us a little bit of progress, and we should be grateful for it, and we should thank them, and we should take what we can get and be quiet for the next 15 years until we get another. He was absolutely clear that they should and they will overturn Roe in full. And then he, with his characteristic combination of excellence and intelligence and eloquence and grace made the argument on the moral issue and on the legal issue basically nonstop for a year. And um, so he, he's, I think more than anybody in the country, he, is, uh, he was a, a leader in what you're describing. Richard Dorflinger, a fellow with the De Nicola Center. Double consciousness. I, I want to make one very brief comment and then ask my question. The American Academy of Pediatrics has a policy in place, been there for many years, and not long ago reapproved. Re policy on how old do you have to be to be the patient of a pediatrician? And their answer is as soon as pregnancy is confirmed, that embryo is our patient. Uh, so talk about double con So they're saying we can end the decision that allows states to protect our patients. Anyway, uh, the double consciousness in the law is amazing, and I wanted to ask whether that can be cited and used in this whole debate, because you have federal laws, for example, say a, a, a man uh, attacks a woman, let's say his, uh, you know, his, his girlfriend or his wife, and he does her some harm, and she's pregnant, and the child dies. In every federal jurisdiction, that's a homicide. Uh, we have the Children's Health Insurance Program federally that, uh, in which a state can uh, provide health insurance for a woman in the name of the unborn child, even if she herself didn't qualify as a, as a minor, as a child. Uh, that was great for the Bishop's Conference because a, you can't order an abortion to help the health of the child, and B, it covers the woman regardless of immigration status, because the child's going to be a citizen as soon as he's born. Uh, so there are all these things that we've done. So, so what they would have to argue is that in law, the fetus is a person or not, depending on the quality known as wantedness. And that's all it is. Uh, I mean, it seems to me that this completely subjectivist 
notion of, of the moral status of people, you have moral status if I wanted you to have it, is something that should be raised as a bizarre uh, aspect of this whole debate. And I wonder if, if you could say whether you think that's something worth pursuing. Yeah, I would say that's not quite accurate though, right? Because let's say you have a woman who's pregnant and is uh, heading to the abortion clinic. She's walking there. And then on the way to the clinic with an unwanted child, she gets murdered. Well, that person would be charged with double murder. So it's not even necessarily the subjective wanting that makes it, um, you know, the exception. Uh, I guess the exception is, you know, she's in there and gives consent, and then at that point. Um, but, but even unwa unwanted children, until they're actually aborted, do have legal protection. Good morning, and thank you for your work and for your magnificent presentations. Um, I work with a pro-life organization that forms pro-life young adults. And so my question would be, um, when we are in a culture where um, pro-lifers are often deemed as having um, fetal tunnel vision, which is ironic um, given your presentations, how can we have conversations on the ground that bring attention to this issue that um, people really aren't giving um, the fetus due attention um, on this issue? while still uh, showing care and concern for the women um, when we are so often um, ridiculed for only caring about the fetus. Thank you. Um, I suspect you're doing that already and uh, encourage you to be encouraged and keep it up. Um, it, it, you can ask questions without, without being um, snarky like well let's 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 reason together does the fetus deserve any regard at all and if so why, or if not why not i mean again to say the fetus to just ask the question is to is to say not i have tunnel vision but can't we look at the thing that's right in front of us doesn't abort isn't there something that's aborted can we talk about what that thing is? Um, while continuing to acknowledge women are in awful situations often, uh, that your posture is not one of just trying to condemn uh, those who are in a position where they feel like the only option they have to keep their life from coming totally unraveled is to have an abortion, which is frequently the case. You can acknowledge that while then saying, but don't we have to see you know, the fetus as well. And in your own ways, of course, I'm not giving a, a cookbook strategy, but I, I, I'd say be encouraged because um, people know it. As, as I think the, the, the refusal to acknowledge the fetus displays, people know that the fetus is a human being and they know that we don't treat any other human beings like we treat these in abortion and that that seems kind of wrong. And so I think just continuing to Peaceably bring that up is is good. Thank you for your work. Yeah, thank you for that. I, I did want to add also that uh, a couple of things that might be helpful to do in those situations is to point out that many women get abortions that don't want to get abortions. So a very famous case recently was Britney Spears, who basically said more or less she was forced into getting an abortion. And so it's not accurate to think of, well, abortion is always helping women. It's always what they want. In many cases, it really isn't. In many cases, maybe most cases, it's an absolute last resort. They feel trapped, they feel like there's no way out of this. And I think too, it, because of that, I think we should emphasize when talking to people that disagree with us, that we are not judging women. Because unless you can know the mind and heart of another person, you can never judge their subjective culpability and know, you know what they understood about the procedure, et cetera. So we are not judging women. In fact, we're, we're helping women because this is incredibly painful, not for all women who get abortions, but for many women, incredibly painful. And they remember the anniversary of this for years to come and they wonder what would the baby be like. I mean, this is, this is a burden that many women have to shoulder. And so we are trying to help the baby, yes, but we're also trying to help all those women who are in terrible situations and also all those women who have chosen abortion. And we don't judge them, we recognize that we can't judge them. Only God alone knows their mind and their heart, and that's, you know, that's not for us to do. 
Well, this has been uh, fantastic. It's been a great reminder to me of how many pro-life heroes we're surrounded by. I mean, we've got three of them up here. We've got Dave Solomon, as was mentioned, Father Miss Campbell, Michael New in the back, who's done great social science and other work on this, and many others of you, and many other people at this conference. It's a, it's a blessed place to be, and uh, the highest of, of good causes. So join me in thanking all of them. <laughs>